And let me turn it down. Recording is on. There we go. Cool. So welcome everybody to our April 2021, our April virtual meeting. Uh, really excited uh, that we've got. Wow, we got 40 people on the uh, on the call tonight. This is great. We're gonna have some good participation. Uh, I've got some. Uh, got a fantastic speaker up first. Uh, I'm gonna go through all that as we get going here. But let me get through with our uh, our normal announcements that we do. So. Basically, how it's going to run down tonight, we will, you know, hopefully everyone's gotten connected now. We're about 6.33. Uh, I'm going to run through my opening announcements. Then we're going to turn it over to Naomi. And then we have Gabriel Gums from uh, Spirion. I haven't seen him connect and I haven't heard from him today. So um, we might be punting for something else uh, for a second part of the meeting. Uh, and then hopefully wrap up and get out of here by 8.30. Or we just might talk Naomi's ear off with, with her AMA as she's going to explain. So who knows? We'll see We'll see how it goes. We'll keep it fluid. All right. Um, special thanks, of course, to our friends over at Invite and to Andy. Unfortunately, I don't think Andy's on tonight. Um, but uh, they're allowing us to use the platform. Got us hooked up. So it's really, really cool. Uh, also, our sponsors that help us with the chapter, we're kind of in that lull state right now because of everything, all COVID and pandemic. So we really haven't been um, utilizing a lot of our sponsors. And uh, we've basically been running the chapter off everybody's chapter dues, which is great. So uh, uh, basically just keeping our, our costs low and, and everything else. If you've never been to one of our chapter meetings, I know we've got some new uh, names in there. Um, if you've never been to one of our chapter meetings, welcome. Uh, essentially, an ISC squared chapter is based on four things, and it's all about connection, education, inspi inspiring, I nearly said inspiration, but inspiring and securing. And basically, everything that we do in the meeting, we want, or any of our events and anything we do, kind of revolve around those four concepts. Uh, so tonight essentially is a little bit of connection. You're going to hopefully maybe, well, we have a chat window. So I know a lot of folks like to chat in there as we go along. Um, but you're going to hopefully get some education from what we're going to get from our speakers. And then hopefully give you some inspiration and then, you know, go off and see the world. So um, let me do this real quick. I'm just going to be nice and mute everybody. And there we go. So that way it's just me. All right. So let's get back over to my slide deck. Here we go. So RIC Squared Board of Directors. Uh, my name is James McGregor. Of course, I think a lot of you know who I am. Uh, chapter president, we have Christopher Hickenell. He's on as well. We're in that awesome looking Jurassic Park t-shirt. He's our membership director. He takes care of all the CPEs for you. Uh, we have Walter Spielman. I don't know if Walter's got his camera on. Oh, he does. There he is. I just see it at the top there. Uh, he's our chapter vice president. Uh, we have Debbie Carr. She's our chapter secretary. Uh, we have Paul O'Connor, who's our treasurer. We have Amy Roops, who handles our uh, sponsorships. So I know we're going to need some of those soon. And then, of course, we have Tom Plummer, who is our education and outreach director. Um, and, um, yeah, so that's us helping you run the board, uh, helping take care of all of you, uh, getting the events and, and everything else. Let's see. Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned last month, it was that kind of time of the year where we have elections. One of the things I did fail to mention was that Debbie and I were still planning on uh, continuing on. We were going to submit our names. Um, and when we told everybody we had, I think, yeah, let me think about it. Yeah, no, we did, we had one person submit to be that was interested and we've kind of had a discussion. Uh, so when it came to the elections, we have had a change. Now, don't everybody freak out. Don't, not, not here to freak everybody out, but we have had a slight change with the board. What we've now done, let me get to the slide here, is we've now added a communications director. And Robert Riba, um, I don't think he's on yet. He said he's going to be running late, but he's going to be handling our communications. So we're going to have somebody that's going to focus on doing all the emails and, and our reservations and everything else like that. Um, so we're excited to bring him on board. Now we're kind of evened out. We got, you know, eight of us all together, four and four. But um, real excited to get bring him on board and uh, he'll be working with us and, and handling our communications uh, for the chapter. So real excited that he's joining us and uh, hopefully get to meet him soon because everything's been all virtual. All right, let's have talk about the upcoming events. What have we got coming? So kind of some changes here too, maybe. We'll see. Uh, right now, next month is will be a virtual meeting and probably June will be a virtual meeting as well. But I got an email 
the other day from our good friends over at ECPI. And for those folks that remember ECPI up in Lake Mary, the, the cybersecurity school, David Cruz helps us out. Um, he reached out to me the other day and said they are now taking groups to come in for events. And I know that SIM, the Society of Information Management, Central Florida, they are going to be doing an event there in May. So we're going to start coordinating uh, to start looking at going back face to face uh, with everybody. But most likely it might be a hybrid because depending on how many, you know, we used to do our events with 50 people. I don't know if we can socially distance 50 people and everything else. Uh, there's some logistics for us to work out whether we do a breakfast brief again or we go to an evening event or we look at, um, you know, we do a hybrid. Uh, because if we go with a hybrid where we have folks attending in real life at the event and then we have folks that are watching virtually we've got to have the camera equipment set up. We've got to be able to stream. We've got to have a good internet connection. So there's some logistics we need to work through, but if we do, I'm, I would really love for us to be able to get something going for June. So basically it's some coordination on our end. We're going to work, uh, work on that over the next little bit, but um, the annual meeting uh, we're basically going to do in October, which is when we're going to do that. Like we did two years ago, with IAC Squared Security Congress because they are going to be back in Orlando. They are doing a hybrid event. They're going to have people there in person as well as virtually. So we'll we'll kick up our chapter meeting. We'll do that the Sunday night, uh, which will be October 17th. Yeah, October 17th. Um, I've got a place in mind, but I haven't got anything formalized or, or finalized. Um, but it's been a, to a place we've been before. So uh, for those of you that know where we've been around town, uh, you might know where that is. Uh, once we have everything in place, we got to get sponsors. We want to make this a big event, uh, bring everybody back. So kind of shooting for October 17th for uh, a chapter meeting right before Congress uh, with the folks that will be there. So um, we're virtual for the next two months. Definitely. We'll see how we go. But if we uh, if we do go back in, you know, in, with everybody in person, uh, it's going to be, you know, with the CDC requirements. What I'm really curious, and because we've got 40 some odd folks on the, the call, I want to kind of get, I could send out a survey and ask people, but I just have one simple question. Um, if you don't want to answer, that's fine. But if we do in-person events, let's say we do June as an in-person event, is that something that you would want to attend? Just drop me a yes or a no in there. I'm not judging or anything. I'm just kind of wanting to get a feel from everybody. If we go back in person, am I going to, how many folks am I going to get interested to kind of come back? So like I said, I got 42. So we'll see how everybody starts chiming in there. Um, I'm itching to get back. And we, those of you may have heard Naomi, we're, you know, she's itching to get back too. And um, we're all looking forward to getting back in person and start doing events. Do it safely. Make sure, um, you know, everybody's practicing safe distancing and all that good stuff, masks, blah, blah, blah. Um, but if we do food, we got to have it individually wrapped. So we got to figure that out as well. So there's some stuff to figure out, um, but we will certainly keep everybody posted as we go along. Okay. So next month for our May event, I just want to bring the friend, friend reminder. It's going to be that quarterly book club thing that we did. You know, we did at the back in we did that February. Yeah. Uh, that we did with Sandworm. This time it's manipulated by Teresa Payton. And if any of you have read the book or are reading the book, great. If you want to be a part of the panel, we're looking for four folks that will want to be on the panel to discuss the book, what their thoughts and insights. If you are interested, Drop us an email, info at isc2chapter-centralflorida.org, uh, and let us know. We, it, uh, it's a great opportunity, A, do a little presenting and panel presentation, uh, but the book is really good. I'm reading it again right now and um, certainly open provides that extra awareness that you may not be aware of with regards to the different nation state attacks and things that are going on um, through propaganda, misinformation, and so forth. So... Again, if you are interested, drop us a note and please let us know. All right. So I've mentioned this before. Now we got a date. Now we got it locked in and now we got registration open. So Hacking 101 course. For those of you that have always wanted to learn how to hack, um, with great power comes great responsibility. And we have our ethics. Just put that out there now. Uh, but we have, uh, we've opened up registration this morning. We're going to do it June 
5th, which is a Saturday, it could be all day. Uh, you'll do it from the comfort of your own home. And we already got nine people signed up already today. Uh, we only have 30 spots. So we practically got a third of the tickets gone already. So if you're interested in attending and participating, um, you're going to basically do this through a browser from what I understand. So you'll connect to their virtual machines and you'll do the work and, and everything else from that. But registration's open. Uh, the link's there. Um, I will drop it into the chat in a little bit. Uh, if you or it's in your email, I sent out the email reminder today for final registration. If you scroll to the bottom of that email, you will see the link to register for our hacking 101 class. So um, I know that Tom has gone through it. He had he had seen the group and was really impressed by it and goes, hey, we should do it with the chapter. So we are doing it with the chapter. We're real excited that we get to do this. So um, if you want to kind of learn more about how ethical hackers or how pen testers, red teamers do it, this will be a great opportunity. And at a hundred bucks for the whole day, it's a pretty good price. All right, so we're not the only game in town. I think everybody knows, but if you don't, um, there's Central Florida ISSA. They just met last Friday. So they'll probably meet again, second week or second Friday next month or third Friday. Um, but there's their website, you can go check them out. We have. Um, the cybersecurity nonprofit, the Orlando chapter, which is run by our good friend, uh, Mr. Henderson, by Bob. Um, they, Bob, do you guys have any meetings coming up? Yeah, May 13th is your next CISO panel. We have the CISO Denver Health. Uh, cool. Northeast is coming in and each month we have a new CISO. July will be the CISO Wendy's, so. CISO for Wendy's, oh cool. Wendy's, okay. yeah. That'll be interesting, cool, fast food yeah. Relations. yeah. Um, Cool. So yeah, so a day in the life of a CISO. That'll be fun. Um, it'll go in line with what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, Citrusec, I know, I don't think Ian's on, but I know they're still kind of on hold as well, but they always do great meetups at the end of the month. And then ISACA, um, I know they're kind of on hold as well. But I know ISSA, Central Florida chapter, has been still meeting virtually, of course. Um, so those are the other, you're welcome to check out those links and, and visit them. So we're at 226 active members, so we're, we're still holding well. We got good renewals coming in. Um, so thank you to all of you for being members. We appreciate it. Looking to um, you know keep supporting you. So that's pretty well all the announcements that I got for tonight. So what I'm uh, what I'm going to do now is is turn it over to, to Naomi Buckwalter, who is a director of information security and IT for a company that's shh, we're not allowed to talk about. Um, but she's also in a podcast. She hosts a podcast uh, with uh, James Azar. I think she's the star of the show, but you know, um, James is a friend of mine, so I always bust his chops. Uh, but um, you can find her on LinkedIn. Go follow her. She's always posting fantastic stories. Uh, she had a great story today regarding somebody trying to get into cybersecurity. It was practically heartbreaking, um, but um, Naomi's here to kind of talk to us about how to break into cybersecurity leadership. So kind of a different perspective. I know we've we've done meetings and had how to get into cybersecurity. So Naomi's bringing a fresh perspective about how to get into leadership if, if there's any of us that really want to do it. And I know that uh, there are some of us that do. So Naomi, I'm going to stop my screen sharing here and turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, James. It's lovely to be here, everyone. I don't have any slides, so you guys can just go ahead and uh, watch YouTube or something if you'd like, or just, <laughs> you don't have to pay attention to me, I'm just saying. Uh, I'm here to help you answer any questions you might have about just anything, uh, but I would like to keep the focus, if we would, to cybersecurity leadership, ideas on breaking in, and sharing just different ways of how we can market ourselves into jumping into, from an individual contributor role, into the managerial space. So just a little bit about me. I've been in technology and security for over 20 years. Uh, security since 2006. I earned the CISSP. I took it in 2010. Yes, way back in the day when it was still paper and pen. Or paper, yep. paper and, pen. <laughs> and it was a six hour exam, James. Do you remember that? I used yep. every single minute of that. I was exhausted. Yep. Uh, and then, of course, I let it lapse enough that I had to retake it. I'm just like, oh, I'll just retake it. I ended up taking the computer-based one. It only took me like 90 minutes. I was like, oh, this is way easier. <laughs> I'm like, I'd rather do this. So I think the, the, the new folks have it way easier. 
uh, one of those old fogies. Uh, I have other certifications too, but uh, yeah, this is my third cybersecurity leadership role. I work in the small and mid-sized business space, but I started my career at Vanguard, which is a very large mutual fund giant. I believe they have a $7 trillion now, James. Isn't that insane? $7 trillion. I can't even quantify that. That is uh, the GDP of a small country, I believe, like Somalia or something. Like It's a very large amount of money. Uh, and they uh, they taught me what good information security practice looks like. And I took all that experience with me and moved into the small and mid-sized world where, yes, I am the CISO, although I don't have the title, I'm the head of information security for Beam Technologies. I keep that confidential so I don't get spam, James. It works. No, hey, no, I, I no works for you. It hey, works. Yeah. If you don't want the spam, take that out. Just say undisclosed or undisclosed. Yeah. On you, get rid of the the, oh, the spam. That's terrible. Uh, so uh, I just started a new job there, and I'm uh, building up a security program from scratch. And this is my third time doing it. I love it. Uh, it's a challenge for me. Um, our company is about 100 million in revenue, so we're not small fry at all. We we have plenty of budget. Uh, plenty of things to do, lots of challenging things. So I'm here to talk about how I broke into cybersecurity leadership and I think ways of, uh, if you guys are interested too. So before I start doing that, if uh, everyone would please type in the chat, if you are in leadership today, or if you are interested in breaking into cybersecurity, I would love to pull the audience and just see where we are right now because you might already be in leadership and, and this is information you don't need. So let's tailor it to the audience a little bit and please answer the question, are you currently in leadership or are you aspiring to be? Just say yes, no, uh, you can even say more if you'd like. I'm chapter leadership, that's about it. Leadership currently, okay, but not leadership, leadership small company. And if you are interested in leadership, you know, just tell us or tell me, type in the chat, you know, what kind of things you're hoping to do. I, I'm just going to be reading some of this during the talk. Oh, Joseph, all right, not currently in leadership, but I suspect the calling's coming soon. Yeah, I can tell you of all my lessons learned because I'm about to drop a bombshell here. But the first time in cybersecurity leadership did not go well for me. I was actually let go from my first cybersecurity leadership job about a year and a half into it because I was just not effective, James. I, I just overcorrected in terms of soft skills. I like was not effective. Everything just scared me. I didn't want to like step on any toes and break any eggs. Uh, so I, I was not able to win the trust and the uh, uh, build relationships with the engineers, honestly, to be able to affect any change, so. I was gonna I, say, I always yeah. thought that CISOs were hired to be fired anyway. <laughs> yeah, not did not have a breach. I, I was let go for, for very business reasons, you know, I just wasn't right. able to, and then the role also shifted into more of a privacy focused thing. And, and they wanted I always to heard that a, a good breach was always a good resume event for a CISO that you've <laughs> been through one, so. Yeah, uh, you know, not ashamed of it at all. It was a very great grow growth opportunity for me. I took that lessons learned. I, I dove straight into my next role um, and I, I crushed it. You know, I just thought I just I did so well there and I loved it. And so now I'm in my third one, uh, hopefully crushing it again. But, you know, that's uh, always to be said. Security metrics for a CISO. How do you measure that? Hmm. Uh, so, yeah. All right, so I'm gonna go through some of these answers here, and I see some of you have answered very, thank you so much for adding additional detail, love it. All right, so we do have some yeses in leadership, but not a CISO, that's not my title. I'm a virtual CISO for a couple of my small clients, but I, I represent them as the head of security. Um, the title really doesn't matter here, as long as you are the highest level of security practitioner at your company and you have accountability, not the accountability, you have the responsibility of uh, securing the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your systems and data, then you are technically a CISO. So I don't say I'm a CISO, I just say I'm the head of information security. It's the same thing. Leadership, small company. Yes, my, my small company is actually 250 people, 100 million in revenue. So we're current, we're growing, you know, we're scaling, doubling in size this year. My team is growing from five to I think eight or nine. So it's still growing. Um, Oh, in leadership director of information security. That is actually my title, director of information security. Senior InfoSec engineer from Stephen Molden. So sort of in leadership, we've got good backing from senior leadership. That's the best, right? When you have your senior leadership team on board with you and you're all on the same team, I love that. So it might just be a title change for you, Stephen. So it could be a simple like, hey, 
you know, a better fit for you might be information security manager or director or something like that. Uh, so you can always make that case that titles are just human made constructs. <laughs> like we can certainly affect change just by asking. All right, so Mike, the Star Wars folks. Nope, not interested, I'm retiring. Good for you, Mike. I hope you enjoy that. You know, I can't wait to, to retire, that's awesome. Uh, Steven, you say again, you want to move up though, it's time. Okay. So I think your role, if you are the highest level of security leader at your company, um, that could just simply be a title change for you. So um, even on your resume, if you are currently looking for leadership roles, your, your resume title can absolutely say security leader. Like you don't have to put your title of security engineer, right? So you can market yourself. Again, your resume is a marketing document for yourself. You can market yourself as a security leader because that's what you are. At your company, you are the highest level of leader uh, in security. So. Um, not in leadership, but would like to be Ken Falana. Awesome. I'm going to just tell you how I did it and I think um, give you some insight into how other people did it. I've heard also. Uh, Chief Information Scapegoat Officer from Josh Martin. So you are already a CISO. Uh, totally, I hope you have the backing of your uh, your executive team. I hope you have a seat at the table because that makes your job so much easier, right? And uh, titles are pay-based back from Steven. Um, yeah, I get that, I get that. But you know what? It, it's all about the company. Like, it, I, I can get into so much things about how capitalism ruins everything. Um, but you know, it's just a conversation you can start having with your company. And if they value you and they should, you can always say, hey, my correct title is information security manager. And would you mind changing it? Right. Um, you can even make the case, you know, like, you know, I'm not looking to move, but right? <laughs> you can always just say something like that. Uh, Robert Thompson says, well, in that definition, I qualify, but don't feel like I'm leading, I'm just doing lots of work. All right. That, uh, I mean, that's true for a lot of leadership roles. In cybersecurity, there's a, in leadership, there's a balance between doing strategy and then the tactical things, especially and particularly in a small and mid-sized business. That's again, 99.7% of all US businesses are small and mid-sized, which is just 500 or fewer employees. So 99.7 of and, and about 43% of all security breaches, according to the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report, uh, occurs within a small and mid-sized business. So there's an absolute need for security practitioners within the small and mid-sized industries. So uh, even though you have plenty of work, we all have plenty of work, you're, end up, you're gonna end up doing the strategy, the strategic work, and then also the tactical work. So it's actually kind of fun. When I do engineering work, that, that brings back the memories of you know keyboard warrior. I still get to get into the sock and I still get to do all these great things. Um, and, but, and at the same time, I get to influence the business. So I'm having practice using my people skills and my soft skills and my ability to influence and persuade. And I love that too. It, it, my day is so varied. I can talk directly to an engineer. I can talk to a product owner. I can talk to a business person, a legal person. And having that scope and just that priority just keeps me alive. I would hate doing the same thing over and over and over again. And I, I kind of don't get that. I mean, some people just love doing one thing and they're really great at it. And we need people like that, right? But I'm definitely on the side of like, give you more, I can't stagnate. I cannot just do one thing forever, I will die. Uh, that's a bit hyperbole, please. Uh, okay, so um, Robert Thompson, okay, you mentioned that Danny Martinez, small business, 30 folks, director of cybersecurity. Dual that, dual hat since we also provide security services. Oh, so you're like an MSSP or something. I am in charge of the company's security, but also in charge of our security services. It is too completely, yeah, and I bet you have to sell too, right? <laughs> like that's part of the thing. Uh, one of my job offers when I got let go, I actually ended up with two job offers within four days. So it was a quite easy story there. But one of the job offers was to be a director of uh, security services or whatever it is. So I would have had to do the same thing, like, you know, head of security and then sell the services and then meet with clients and write proposals. I'm like, yeah, I don't think, I don't think I like that very much. But if you like that, Danny, I'll write it off to you because we need more security practitioners and people who understand the benefits of good information security. Josh Martin says, oh no, that was just a plain joke. Josh, I don't know what the joke was, but I'm sure it was hilarious. Danny writes back, I write many proposals since I work with the government. Yes, uh, and you will always have a uh, cornerstone client there. <laughs> Your government uh, loves contractors. All right. 
Okay. Oh, Debbie has, her, I'm going to guess her. I don't want to assume pronouns here. Debbie has her own company. That's awesome. I love it. John Clifton, uh, ISSO, not leadership. Okay. And uh, not leadership, I like to be. Hmm. Is the O not stand for officer there? I don't know what ISSO might mean for your company. Information security systems officer, is that not it? Okay. I don't know what that is. Uh, and different companies have different things. Like some CISOs report to the CTO or the CIO. You know, I report to the CTO, but we the CTO is really just all of engineering, data analytics, uh, all of the things of engineering. And then so I sit parallel with my peers, engineering, infrastructure, you know, all that stuff all together. And then we have under me is the IT team. So a team of three. Uh, we we do all the help desk. We do IT procurement, project management, IT, and all those things. So uh, really fun stuff. I, I like to think of security as you know, if it's a triad, sec security is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, I like to think of IT as the availability piece of that triad. It's the leg that keeps the business running and operating as efficiently as possible. Security is there to make sure it is both efficient and secure. So uh, IT. Uh, is on my team and it, different companies do it differently. I don't like it when it's flipped upside down, by the way. I don't think security should report to IT. I think the availability conflict of interest will always win out. Like think about how the pandemic has really changed the mindset. Of we just needed our business systems to be up and running. So what did we see? We saw a lot of networks being ripped apart and just open it up firewalls so people weren't in the office anymore they weren't connected to them. so they actually ended up having to open up all the things to the public internet and people now started connecting from home and from whatever uh from the coffee shops that didn't exist uh so and then you just saw a lot more security problems right and then just to roll on top of that it's more security controls more technical and administrative controls and the thing was a mess and, and luckily uh only a few major breaches <laughs> oh lord uh the pandemic is great all right so Here's how I did it. Uh, I would say, I, I, I wanna say I got lucky, but again, it's the power of the written word. So this is what I did. I was not really looking for a move into cybersecurity leadership, but I knew I had more in me. I knew I loved influencing and persuading. It's a little bit of that social engineering aspect of being a security practitioner. You're like, I, I know how you tick and I know how to manipulate you. Unless that sounds a little psychopathic and it definitely is, but I don't mind it. I, I totally want to like change your behaviors, right? I want you to be on the winning team. I want to win with you. And so I knew I had more in me. So I started writing. I just wrote a couple blog articles, maybe five or six, and I wrote about different things. The first thing was, you know, how to win hearts and minds for security. It's about building trust, about building relationships and how to how to just build that rapport with the business because you guys know this as security practitioners, it is like immensely difficult to get the business to like do anything security, right? Like they just, they don't want to be bothered. They think it's a pain. They think security people are just egotistical and small. And yes, a lot of that is true. But, but I wrote in my article, like ways of building relationships with the business and like how to win hearts and minds. So that was my first article. I went on from there. There were things about vulnerability management and how terrible that's done. It was like basically a rant on security questionnaires and how terrible those are. And I, I went on, I talked about uh, tools that the DevOps teams need, you know, what and en what engineers are really looking for in terms of information security, how can we best enable them to do their jobs well. My favorite domain, by the way, is application security. I worked with giants within the application security industry. Jeff Williams, who founded OWASP, I learned from him. A former CISO of Twitter, I sat, I sat next to him and learned from him. There's plenty of uh, things that we do not do well in uh, information security, by the way, because we were never developers. And, and yes, I was a developer. I have two master's degrees, one's in computer science and one's in technology management from Villanova. And my undergrad degree is in computer engineering. So I have plenty of technical experience, but I realized this. I realized I don't need technical back experience to be effective. In fact, I found the opposite. I was this smug like jerk when I was coming up through security because I thought I was the smartest person in the room, like I was just this overconfident uh, little bastard. Like I'll just say it, like I was just a terrible person. Uh, I would look down on people in the business, anyone who wasn't in security, anyone who wasn't technical, I would just scoff at them. I would just say, you don't know anything. You're an idiot. You don't do anything right. Uh, I'm here to save the day. I'm here to do everything right for you. You just have to listen to me, right? And so I, I, I ended up with this um, 
<laughs> this uh, set of uh, people who were just saying, you know, yeah, not a lot of people like you, Naomi. Yeah, I, and that really helps me reflect on myself. I, and that started a journey of just self-awareness. And I realized, oh, my God, like, yeah, they're right. Like, I'm not effective at my job. No one's listening to me. They're hiding security problems from me. They're not inviting me to uh, meetings. They're just doing things, shadow IT all over the place. And I realized that was hurting our company. And it wasn't a good thing. Like, I wanted the best. I had the best of intentions, right? But the way it was coming out for me was the fact that I was just the biggest jerk in the world and nobody wanted to work with me. They were avoiding me. They, you know, didn't answer the phone. We still did phones um, and, and meetings were a bust, right? I, I would just very methodically just go through, this is what we're going to do and this is black and white and blah, blah, blah. And I would just prescribe to them solutions that they didn't even want or need because I wasn't meeting them where they were. They didn't understand the importance of security. They weren't convinced it was the right thing to do. So I ended up just getting this level of self-awareness and it, it took years, I would say. It, it wasn't an overnight thing. Eventually I got to the point where, uh, you know, I started writing about all these things that I learned and then I got my first cybersecurity leadership job to finally answer the question is because somebody found me, uh, my blog, and I do love to write. I write for myself. I have plenty of things to say. I call it my 20 years of pent up rage. Uh, James, I'm sure you have 20 years of pent up rage. I'm sure everyone here has 20 years of pent up rage. Uh, and it started coming out. And But I, I'm able to at least sound like a normal, sane person when I'm writing. So I write. I write for myself. It's cathartic. And I wrote about it. And somebody found me and they said, hey, we're looking for to hire a security engineer. I'm like, oh, well, I'm a security engineer. Great. Uh, let's let's do this. Let's interview, right? And so uh, throughout the interview, I noticed they didn't have a security program. It was a very small startup, you know, 100, 100 people, um, got good funding and everything else. A really, really strong culture. And I'm like, hey, this would be great. I would love to join your team. So I convinced them that they didn't need just a security engineer. They needed someone to build a security program. And like, hey, you actually need someone to start from scratch, you need policies, you need to follow a framework, you need security controls, you need uh, penetration tests. And I went in with the title Director of Information Security. I did not know what that meant. Like it was just, I went from security engineer on a Friday and then on a Monday I ended up with a Director of uh, Information Security title and I didn't really understand it because it was a brand new thing. So I walked in there completely like, okay, I'm just going to do my thing. I'll just create some policy documents and uh, get the engineers to fix this. And I went about it the entire wrong way. So again, completely ineffective at that job. I was let go uh, on a Wednesday. So I do remember that. Um, but it was a great experience in terms of growth and learning and just uh, building that grit and the ability to just be like, it's okay, right? Like survive. Uh, and I learned so much from that. So I think everyone should get fired, James, at least once in their career. <laughs> I think it's such a good thing. Uh, and, and I was sorry for myself for maybe 30 minutes. Um, but I realized the opportunity I had to just grow from that was uh, amazing and astounding. And I took advantage of it. So uh, so from there, I just end, ended up doing more security leadership. And I just grew in complexity and environments. And now I'm in the insurance space where we do technology, we do IoT, and we do uh, in insurance technology, insurance tech, insure tech, yeah, some crazy term point. Uh, and I've been there about three months. We uh, do natural insurance. Yes, very uh, amazing things with teeth. We have plays on teeth, uh, wordplay on teeth all the time. Uh, it's actually quite embarrassing. Anyway, so that's how I broke into security leadership. It's literally because I wrote all the things that I had been thinking about anyway, my 20 years of pent up rage. Somebody found me, I think at the time I had about 500 <laughs> followers and I had like, uh, you know, 20 people reading my blog. Um, uh, but, you know, something started to happen. And I just realized, you know, the written word is very powerful, right? If you have your ideas, share them with the world. People are hungry for originality and, and content and, and just thoughts. And we don't want to hear the same things over and over again. On LinkedIn, you're seeing the same things. You're seeing, I took the certification exam. You know, I passed this. Great. That's awesome. But tell me how you've contributed back to the community. That's what we want to see. We want to see original thought, original leadership, and just ideas on how to make our community better. And what 
that what can help you, uh, fellow listener, is the the fact that not a lot of people are doing this. I think the lightest statistic is like you know only three percent of people actually post content about themselves every day. It's probably less than that. You know, like only about you know fifty percent of people even log in, and then like the three percent of that is actually posting original content. So in order to stand out, first of all, all you have to do is contribute back to the community and it can be anything you want. It can be just be like, hey, I am learning about cloud security that launch and here are all the things that I'm using for learning and, and, and growth there. Here's some YouTube channels and some books uh, and things like that and just write about it. That's all you need to do. You don't need to go crazy. You know, something like this, you know, I attended the ISC squared Central Florida meeting uh, and Naomi was ranting about something and, and I thought she was ridiculous. And then you just write about all the things that I said that was ridiculous. I'm okay with it. And I'll take that personally. So, so that's what you do. You write your thing, you get people to be like, yeah, that's bullshit or whatever it is, you know, or like, I agree with that. And then you start a conversation and then you end up getting people interested, more and more interested about your, your thoughts and your feelings about things. And it's, it's very cool. You start building an engaged community of people and guess what? And this is how I found my current job. The person reached out to me, hey, we got a, a role for a security leader. Are you interested? I'm like, you know, I'm not really looking, but hey, why not? I ended up falling in love with the company, the culture, the people, and I was just like, this is my next step. And boom, 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 uh, you know, 18 interviews later, <laughs> that, that ha ended up happening. I, I think there were like 74 other applicants. So um, I didn't luck out. I made my own luck there. But I, I knew if I kept putting out my thoughts about things, could be right or wrong, I'm okay with rejection because I know I can grow from that. Again, I've been fired. I will say that again. I have been fired. I am not ashamed of that. I grew from that. People insult me online they call me a whore or whatever it is i'm okay with that i know i can grow from that and that is what you you don't want to be scared about putting yourself out there you're okay because you're human everyone makes mistakes recognize that in yourself and put yourself out there be a little vulnerable and people things happen people are going to be attracted to that they're going to start sending you messages hey i really appreciate that you've brought up this topic uh, i've been struggling with unemployment for two years i'm just glad someone else is saying that I love that kind of stuff because you know you're making a positive impact on people. And that's what we want to do as humans, right? You want to have that human connection. And the more you can bring of yourself into the world of social media, which is, by the way, super marketed and contrived and fake, right? As long as you bring that level of authenticity that is so rare and unique to the world of social media, you will stand out amongst the crowd. And guess what? People are constantly looking through their feed for the next leader. They want to see a level of empathy and emotional intelligence and the ability to connect with people. And so if you can be one of them and you are looking to break into cybersecurity, you do that. You post your thoughts and you be a little vulnerable. And that's how people are attracted to you. And that's how you can get to that next level. So I will say one of the very easy ways that you can start doing today is just starting to post your thoughts. Do not post other people's content. Post your own content and be vulnerable and just be real. And you will be the person where people are like, this, I wanna just learn, just hear more from this person. And, or you'll have a, your set of haters, of course, everyone gets haters. But the haters are now gonna bring with them their own set of haters, which is very interesting. And you end up with this engaged community and uh, somehow people enjoy what I write. Uh, I, I can't tell you how, but the uh, you know LinkedIn algorithm, go, go ahead. I, I don't know what it's doing, right? But it's very, very interesting. And if you wanna level up in your leadership career, that's one way of very easily putting yourself out there and being unique and getting the attention of recruiters, in my case, or hiring managers in other people's cases. And if you are constructive and you build community and you build rapport, that history of your social media, your Twitter, anything else like that, the hiring managers are now gonna go back to all the things that you've said. So you need to have a consistent history. It's not just one or two things every week. Try to do it a lot more than that. Be consistent. It doesn't have to be 1,300 characters, which by the way is the limit on a LinkedIn post, but you want to at least be consistent and post things. It could be three words. One of my posts was confidentiality, integrity, availability, bacon. Right, like that is ridiculous and it makes no sense, but you know what, it's hilarious. I think it's funny, I like bacon. And it just shows you as a real person, as a human, and you're not this abstracted value that you are now just this fake person, right? You wanna be real and I think that's what, uh, 
That's what human connection is all about, and that's what humans are looking for. Because if you think about it, oh my God, I've been ranting about this for a little bit now. Sorry, James. 20 years. 20 years. Here we go. I know. So the idea is like uh, the hiring managers are looking to hire people. They don't want to hire computers. And yes, you might be very technical, great, but they are also looking for a nice coworker, someone to share their weekend plans with, to someone to, you know, I can see myself working with this person because they bring with them a great communication or they bring with them great emotional intelligence. I can see them working with my business clients because I know they won't be an ass, right? <laughs> like I used to be. God, what an ass I was. Right, and so it took me a long time to shift that mindset. Like I can grow from this, I can learn, I can be a better person, and that's what hiring managers are looking for. And it particularly within your current company, if you're looking to move towards leadership, you want to build relationships. Yes, leaders need to be able to influence and persuade. By, def by def definition, a leader does not do all the things that the team members do. Like the leader has to guide and instruct and advise and, and, and just point everyone in the same direction. And you're not doing all the tactical work, you're doing strategy, you're forming and you're building winning relationships and teams. That's what a leader does. And so your supervisors and the people in the executive team, they're gonna look to you to provide both the technical guidance and also, are you an asshole? Like if you're, I'm sorry, James, for my uh, <laughs> language. It's all good. You know what it was? It was to talk about uh, alligators. So. I'm a sailor. I'm used to it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I won't. I won't say anything other than that. Uh, so yes. Yeah, so you, so you want to be a, a a nice person? Like I know, not everyone's just just like naturally. Uh, good at that, but okay, here here it is. My one plug for the day. Uh, the book is called The Smartest Person in the Room. I just picked this up over the weekend, uh, about a quarter of the way through, uh, easy read, I would say. But um, Christian Espinosa, uh, he is a wonderful, wonderful writer and inspiration here, but he posits that the reason why we're losing this, the war on cybercrime is because we are assholes. Essentially, he doesn't say assholes. Let me just try to. Is there like an index? There is not an index. Okay, so the the fact that we're losing is because we're just purely technical. We're about the zeros and the ones. We're very black and white in our prescriptions for solutions. We don't talk to the business. We don't empathize with the business. We don't understand what they need, and that is holding us back from making real change in the business. So the business sees us, right? They see us walk into the room. Oh, great. Here comes a security asshole. Again, alligators. Thank you. The idea now is this, the, there's a, there's a, there's a thing, there's a, you know, a stress between you. There is this like, oh, it's a tug of war. And now the security person is not, not on the team of the business person. No, you're not on the same team. You are against each other. Your business has one objective. Your security team has another objective and you are pulling and pushing and making each other's lives miserable for what? Just because the security professional needs to be right? Like we need to be the smartest person in the room. We need to have the ego satisfied. Like that, come on, get over yourself. You know cybersecurity is not that difficult to learn. Come on, like we all, we are smart enough. We can get this. And so having that mentality of, you know, I need to be the smartest person in the room. I must, I must. That is holding us back from winning the war on cybercrime. And I will tell you, if anyone's listening and you still doubt me, just go ahead and pull up any statistic about cybercrime and you will see objectively that we are losing the war on cybercrime. It is not just this thing, a mirage that the newscasters and CNN are telling us. Uh, so yeah, the idea is to be more human, have the ability to connect with people. I hate calling it soft skills people skills, human skills, have the ability to influence and persuade. And you will notice this change. You will notice that no longer is the business and the security team, no longer are they fighting against each other. We are now on the same team. We have the same objective, which is to get the business from point A to point B in the most secure and efficient way possible without running into any speed traps or falling into the pit of despair or alligators and getting around that. And so you are guiding them and advising them and doing their objectives and accomplishing their objectives. And now you security professional are guiding and helping them and achieving the same goals. You're on the same team. And what the business is not seeing, it's the fact that we are on the same team. How many of you understand the business? 
right? You probably at a superficial level, like, yeah, I understand. But do you know how your business makes money? Do you know, do you understand the P&L of your org charts? Like, do you understand how, what the problems are for the business and how your team can help solve those problems? Because I guarantee you, not a lot of us can do that. And I understand that might just be a fixed mindset of not really caring too much. You know, as long as my security team is doing great, I'm fine. As long as we're not getting breached every day, we're doing great. You know, I, that's my man voice. Uh, so I will say like the, the security professionals that I've seen, and again, I have plenty of anecdotal evidence. Um, and there, there's, it, I can tell you so many stories, James. I'm just talking to James right now. <laughs> it's the only person I know. James, Mike, and Steven. Um, I lost my train of thought. So the, the idea is to, to be a business enabler to help the business achieve its goals. We'll align your objectives of the security team with the business and you will see miracles. Not only will that help your career because you are getting shit done, you are also helping the business achieve its goals, whatever it is, whatever mission it is, to make the world a better place, whatever, whatever. Like you are there to help the business. You are not the cart that leads the horse. I understand that, right? I used to think that security was the reason why the business existed. Like when I was at Vanguard, literally security ran the show. We would walk in the room and we'd be like, security's here now, we're gonna save the day, we're gonna do whatever we want. And we literally had so much money, it was ridiculous. We could implement a tool like that. We can be like, we want a new SIM, got it, right? We, we want all these things, got it. Like we had a sock building that was literally the size of like a apartment complex. Like it was insane and, and, and we had so much, so much power and control over that business, I'm telling you. And for good reason, you know, people's money and, or whatever. But um, for other businesses, that might not be the, the truth there because not every business is run by compliance and have the power and backing of the government and, you know, fines and fees and things like GDPR or whatever. So you might not have that power and control. But so in that case, it's essential that you have emotional intelligence and the ability to influence and persuade. Without it, you won't get anything done. You won't be affected by your job. And let me tell you, I knew that because I was fired. I will tell you that again. I was fired because I didn't realize the importance of emotional intelligence. And when I finally did, it was too late, right? All right, I've talked long enough. Obviously, this has been a rant. All right, let's read some comments. So would you consider yourself a thought leader? And if not, what, what qualities do you consider to be a, for a thought leader? Or is it an overrated buzzword in the industry? James, I don't know what I am right now. Ah! Well, I know I'm not an alligator hunter, right? <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Well, I'm first and foremost a human. So I like to think uh, cybersecurity as a microcosm of the universe that we live in, which is just the world. You know, I haven't been to space. I don't know what was. But in my universe, which is the world, uh, we are humans first. Uh, it doesn't matter what race you are, what skin color you are, how, how dark your skin is, how slanted your eyes are. Uh, it really is, it comes down to the fact that we all are humans. We have souls. And I know there might be some atheists out there, but if, if you define God as a uh, all-knowing being in the sky, yes, that, there is no God. There, <laughs> that is not a thing, right? But if you think of God as love and, and, and love, that's all it is. If you think of God as love, then our souls are just reaching for that. To go back to God, to go back to love, that is what we are as humans. We are desperate and searching. We are souls hungry for love. And every one of us has a need to be loved. We have a fear of not being loved. This pandemic has shown this, James. I'm still speaking to James. James, the <laughs> level of depression and anxiety. The, I'll tell you, in Japan, more suicides have resulted from this pandemic than the actual deaths from COVID in Japan. I'll just say that. That is, that is so sad to me. Like we are humans. We need love, we need protection. We need, we need our fears you know, quieted and, and just be like, you know, everything's gonna be okay. And so if we understand that we are humans first, everything else falls into place. So no, I'm not a thought leader, James. I'm definitely, I would say, I, 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 want, I want this message heard, which is everyone has value. 
it doesn't matter what you are, who you work for, how much money you make, you know, what school you went to. And, and, and all that is just so superficial and, and ridiculous. But the fact that we are all human, I see you, Jose, I see you, Eric, we're the same, we're equals, we're, we're, we're human. And there's nothing about you that makes you less. There's nothing about you that makes you less. And I, I, I wish more people could see that. And so if we could just go out and put that message out there and say, we are humans first, be kind, just be kind, that's it. Love one another, treat others as you would love yourself. The greatest commandment, right? Love one another. Uh, it's so true, it's so simple. And yet it's so hard to do. We're all speechless, holy cow. Um, so with regards to the whole cybersecurity leadership, is there, you know, a lot of the times I see people and you, I know you've seen it as well, Naomi, you've talked about it, it's people getting burned out. You know, whether you're, you know, a CISO or whether you're a frontline analyst, senior analyst, engineer, whatever the case may be. What is one of the things that keeps us drawn in with working in cybersecurity? And what's one of the things that, that you've seen that, you know, is the advantage and disadvantage of being in this, being a cybersecurity leader, really? Advantages of being a cybersecurity leader. Uh, well, you'll always have to work. Good, and then you look at the bad, or yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah you know, if somebody there. wants to get into leadership. Mm -hmm. Is it all cracked up to be? Is it yeah. as crazy and and mind numbing and killing you kind of <laughs> as it is? What are you? Yeah. Oh, to? great question. You know, it can certainly be that way, especially on smaller teams where I'm I'm very much in the weeds with the tactical stuff. So you, you know, sometimes I'm looking at SOC alerts. So I'm playing a lot of different hats at any one time. I love okay. I love it. You know, my day is so varied. Um, but if you have the support of the business, it gets a lot easier. You're not constantly fighting for resources and, and headcount and budget and all that stuff. You're able to get your job done a lot easier because you've already convinced the business through your ability to win hearts and minds for security. You are able to already convince them, whether it's your steering committee or your board meetings or what have you. Like they, they understand security is important. Again, if you ask any executive, is security important? I'm going to use my man voice. Is security important to you? They're going to say, yes, of course, security is important. It's like diversity, equity, inclusion, right? Like you ask any executive anywhere and they're like, oh yeah, diversity, you know, everything, security is important. Right, but then you look at the evidence of that. You're like, it is, is your statement supported by actual evidence? Uh, and you take a look at the, the budget for cybersecurity, or you take a look at like the two people doing cybersecurity on the team or on the entire company, and you're like, hmm, uh, I'm gonna call BS on that because I don't think so. <laughs> right, that's my Urkel voice. Uh, and so, yeah. <laughs> when you have a breach, and the first thing they say is, we take cybersecurity seriously. And my response to that always is, um, well, you don't take it seriously enough or no, you don't, because if you did, you wouldn't have this. Um, your people would be educated and trained to spot a phishing attack or a spear phishing attack. I mean, you would have a SOC team and be able to catch it a lot sooner. Now, you know, that's kind of, you know, I'm speaking from the Monday morning quarterback position, but, um, you know, when we keep seeing the amount of the, the cost of, spending on cybersecurity products and tools going up and so are the breaches going along with it um it, it and you touched upon it earlier Naomi. It's, it's like okay we're still spending we're still having the breaches we're not winning the war here what do we need to do and then when you look at the verizon data breach report you see that the number one way in is through phishing and through uh, breach credentials it's like why aren't we doing enough to, to fix that or why, and I don't mean companies in specific, I'm talking about just generally in the industry. Um, I, had a, I was having dinner with my wife the other night and we were talking about, I was talking about a video I had made all about passwords. I used Fiverr and had a, a schoolhouse rock type video of learning about passwords created through Fiverr, got it, the song written, did the lyrics, made the video and, and I showed it to her. And she basically looked at me and she goes, this is great, it's cute, but Nobody wants to make a 16 character password. I was sitting at a, I was at a brewery yesterday here in Orlando and I'm sitting with the friends of ours and I look across and there are these 20 something year olds and one of them's got a Mac. He's got an older MacBook Pro. And I saw him open up the lid and he tapped the space bar for the login and I saw him literally hit three keys. And it was the number one, the number two and the number three. Nice. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, can somebody distract him so I can go, you know, <laughs> steal his left. No, um, you can't but, have nice things. 
What's that? You just can't have nice things. Yeah. That's why we can't have nice things. Exactly. Um, but it was like, you know, people will, you know, buy, you know, passwords are such a pain in the butt. People hate them. Yes. They're like underwear. We all have to, you know, use them and, and um, got to change them regularly and don't share them with anybody. But, you know, how do we make that easier from a technology standpoint? How do we make that from a cultural? Yeah, it's great. Everybody comes up with passphrases then, you know, I really love working at school or whatever your password is. But, you know, where can the technology come in? And there is technology out there like the Yubi keys and, and the, the FIDO and, and, you know, all the other identity access management tools and single sign on stuff. But that's not being accepted across the board. And until that's fully accepted, the technology is not even winning. So it's um, – there's here, here you go. I'm 20-year rant coming on. Um, <laughs> Great. Join me. Uh, um, but that's the kind of – that's the, you know, what we're seeing a lot of. You know, yeah, we want to spend more money on technology, but we don't – or spend more money on security, but we don't get it until there's a breach. Um, if you've got an organization that's giving you the money, that's great. Um, and you haven't been breached, that's great. But we still see every day organizations getting breached because of a variety of different things. So, yeah. There was a question in there. I don't know where oh. it was. <laughs> I, I, I know. I think I, I want to reiterate what you just said, right? Like, yeah. make it usable. <laughs> like, don't, you're the reason why we can't have nice things is because we make security so impossible to use. Uh, if you think of, again, the, the, the triad CIA, in the middle of the triad, it really is usability, right? The fact that we make security so difficult and impossible to understand and to use, and we make it seem like this abstract, vague thing, and like only the select few can learn it, right? Like, we make it so hard to understand that people are just gonna be like, I'm just gonna do the minimum and then I'm gonna make it as easy as possible. I'm gonna set my password to one, two, three, because uh, I can remember that, it's just really easy. Yeah. Like the con the the convenience uh, and security are always at odds, right? And so what good security and the best security is invisible. If you just have great security and the user doesn't even notice, uh, uh, you know, I think Apple products does this pretty well and you don't really, yeah, the user just does its thing. Like, yeah, we're going to protect you. But that's not going to be true for everything. You're still going to need an educated public. <laughs> like, you still need yeah. cybersecurity practitioners at the very basic levels. And that's what I'm trying to say with my most my most recent post uh, on LinkedIn. It's just really the idea that cybersecurity is a language. And, and it's a language that everyone can kind of speak. But we don't really feel comfortable maybe being, we're not completely fluent in it. And you know we're not experts in this language. We can't break down the linguistics. And we can't tell you all the things. But at a certain level, all of us have to be able to speak this language. If we are to win this war on cybercrime, all of us need to have some basic knowledge of cybersecurity and information security. We need to be able to protect ourselves and our families and our friends and our communities. If we can't do that, there's going to be holes. Right, it's just a one week link, and cyber the cybersecurity professionals have to be right a hundred percent of the time. It is just the, the the attackers and the criminals; they just have to be right the one time. They just need to find that weak one weak link, one phishing, one smishing, one any ishing. They go in there and they just find the one person, maybe not really uh follow, you know, really thinking about it. You know, somebody like Troy Hunt. Uh, you know, he does the uh, have I been phoned on the phone. website? Yeah, so that he does, he's been he's been fished. <laughs> like, if somebody like him can be fished, we can all be fished, exactly, yeah, exactly right? How, like, how tired we are, how you know, exactly. exhausted or completely yeah. you know, not really paying attention, and, and you know, you're kind of zooming through it and trying to, to uh, you know, get onto the next email or close up the inbox, or, exactly. Or, so, um, so catch them on the right time, catch them on the right day, and yeah, and you're fish. So you know, it can happen to the best of us. And so um, make it usable. What was the name of your book that you had, you showed? Not my book. Not your book, the book. Smart person in the room. All right, thanks. Yeah. Uh, how much is it? I don't know. So you probably heard early on we, uh, um, we've got a book club meeting next month, and it's with Teresa Payton's. But that one, like, could be something we add in here for uh, the next book club. I just dropped the link in the chat for anybody yeah. that wants to see it. So. Thank you, President at ISC2 chapter centralflorida.org. <laughs> what a domain. <laughs> I won't even. Hmm. Is that what it comes up? Oh, it comes up because it's I'm logged in with my email address. That's why it shows up. Like I know. That's what I was making fun of your domain name. Um, yeah, so I. <laughs> it's ridiculously long. 
Oh, it's on Amazon for eight bucks. Oh my god, I feel totally gypped out. I think I paid full price for this art. Well, that's eight for the Kindle. Eighty eight for the Kindle. Kindle. I can't do Kindle. I just uh, paperbacks nineteen. Um, yeah. So hey, I'm ready for questions. Throw them in here. Ask ask away. Ask away. We got about another fifteen minutes or so. So if you guys got uh, got questions for Naomi about being in leadership. So we learned that one of the companies you worked for was Vanguard one you got fired from? No, I did not get fired. <laughs> Vanguard doesn't fire anyone. I think that's part of the problem. No. Uh, no, that was a company called Litmus, a wonderful company. I'm still in touch with their head of information. <laughs> like I'm his mentor. It's hilarious. Like I, I'm still fond of the, the time I had there. It was just, I was ineffective at my job. I'm glad they let me go and I learned a lot from it, but I don't hold any grudges. Like it's, it's just hilarious how I'm still a part of their community, right? But <laughs> just not getting paid anymore. But uh, yeah, happy to share any lessons about that and uh, the immediate aftermath and how I was able to bounce back from that. I'm sure you know, I can't be the only one who's been let go, right? Especially a security leader. But I'm sure it'll happen again in my lifetime because it, it's really your, it's funny, I've heard this, but it's your personality that gets you the job, but it's also your personality that gets you fired. Like it's the same personality, but like business objectives change and the leadership changes and you're no longer favored. It's just like, ah, they're a liability, you know? And so, yeah, I wasn't effective. I wasn't able to implement change fast enough at the speed a startup required. And it was one, it was my first startup. So there was a lot of learning curves that I had to get over. But uh, yeah, there was, there. Uh, I still have plenty of fond memories. It was all remote. I think it was another thing that kind of held me back from being effective was the fact that I, I was not good at being a remote worker, right? And like, even in this current environment where everyone's remote, it's almost better for me because I know everyone's remote. There's not an in-office hybrid kind of situation and I'm able to meet with the, the right people and, and build relationships. But I also knew that if I worked from home, I would be easily distracted. So having that level of self-awareness uh, and understanding that I'm pretty much shit when I work from home, it's pretty bad. So I ac actually ended up renting an office, it's like an eight by 10 jail cell, I like to call it. Uh, I set up a little, you know, put some stickers on the back here. It looks like wallpaper. Uh, and then I put, you know, my little things. I have my screens. Uh, I'm able to work here all day long, and I love it. So. so you're not working from home per se. You're working from a little. Wow. I'm working from an office. Yes. From a, a, a void office somewhere. <laughs> yes, confidential. Uh, yeah. So nobody, nobody can dox me and find me. And uh, I do have my share of stalkers, James. It's very weird. Somebody uh, proposed to me on um, Discord. I just thought that was very weird. Yeah, the internet's weird. People are so cool. I love it. People on Discord are weird. But that's me. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, happy to answer any questions. I know we're running out of time. Well, I can just keep talking. I'm sure everyone's tired of that. Uh, I still have yet to eat dinner. So. Oh, shoot. Yeah. Um, if you haven't checked out, um, Naomi was uh, on the Wild West Hacking Cast a couple months ago. She talked about breaking into cybersecurity. So if you work with students or work with people or you're mentoring anybody have them watch that video because i attended that one and it was fantastic oh thank um, you yeah the uh yeah the wild west hacking cast great great series of um speakers they've got on there had on there and coming up there um, oh yeah i'm i'm on tomorrow too i was gonna ask can you, can you put the link in for, the, for that one too oh you're on it nice i'm gonna have to listen to that one cool james yeah. here comes here comes naomi's Thanks. It's a weird link. Yeah, I'm, I'm teaching again for the next two weeks. Semester's almost over, and I need something for the last week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh do you? Yeah. Okay. Well, this is, yeah, it's about breaking into cybersecurity and the reasons why. I ignore that link. That's IT, and I have a couple of students, so. There's a YouTube link. That's Naomi's presentation. So, uh, breaking into uh, truth, dirty truth behind getting into cybersecurity. Um, but um, the, uh, where is, oh, yeah. Copy link. And the second link I'm dropping in is the registration for tomorrow attack and cast. And that's you. What are you going to talk about? I'm talking about why security awareness program isn't enough to secure your network. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, 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 hey. No, no, I'm not laughing at you. I'm like, yes, you're right. <laughs> like, I was oh, like, oh. okay. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, you're right. You're so right. Uh, yeah, I'll have to <laughs> register. Sorry, James. I can't. See, I'm telling you, I'm always learning about myself. I'm like, oh, body language and posture and everything. No, I. Will ever get to a safe, secure state 
or if it is a forever battle because of the rate of change, new apps offer security. Ooh, Carl asked that question. Carl yeah, that whole SaaS question. thing. Like, do you ever get to see? So yeah, the more the trend to SaaS is like the death of security. Is like goodbye security, everything. It's like literally anyone can sign up for a SaaS product with like a credit card and just like a like a sign your Google SSO ID to it, right? Like you can just log in, and so like boom, there goes <laughs> pretty much all your data because uh, SAML SSO is very interesting. It's an authorization protocol. It is actually not an authentication protocol. So, uh, so SAML um, basically just gives you the app access to whatever scope you allow it to. But usually, that's just your email, your calendar, and stuff like that. So, yeah, goodbye security. <laughs> it's just so hard. The perimeter is just not there anymore. It's just there is all, no all of the internet. Yeah, and so now you're just trying to mitigate the impact and the damage control. You're just doing it, damage control at this point. And really, the point of security is not to stop every and all breach from happening. It's really when a breach happens, and yes, they will happen, it's to limit the impact of that breach from making any kind of uh, damage to your business. So um, again, confidentiality, integrity, availability, and usability, if you want to include that within the triangle, um, making sure they lessens the impact of those three things, having a negative impact on your business. And that is what our jobs are for. Any other questions from anybody? Hey, James. Yeah. Hey, it's Avi. I just wanted to know if she accepted the proposal. The Which Discord proposal? proposal? Oh, the, the Discord. Oh, God. Oh, God. No. What? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thanks. I needed that laugh. No, um, no, but I've had people ask me where I live so they can come visit me. And, uh, you know, okay. your, your standard weirdos out there. Uh, and just so you know, you are blocked and reported. But here's the thing. Here's a very interesting thing. As a female, I have to be very careful of who I block and when to block. So you, you, you people don't know this. You guys don't know this. But when you say something creepy, we have to block you. But we don't block you right away because we don't want the ire and the anger coming back at us, right? We have to wait a few days until everything is like, oh, they forgot about us. Great. Now we block because we don't want that coming back to us in terms of like, oh my God, you know, I got blocked. Oh, I'm just gonna rampage and rah, you know, and call the SWAT on them. And so th th those are the things that females have to think twice about. Uh, you know, I'm sure other females listening to this, and like, yeah, yeah, preach, sister, preach, because that's literally what we go through, and it's literally exhausting. So that's unfortunate. Yeah. Brian had a good question. I like that. What do you think about the FBI going into the uh, organization's exchange servers, removing the <laughs> shells? Um, okay. But the hackers. Are so thought, yeah, great for confidentiality and integrity, but what if they went and turned something off for, for availability? So I, I have mixed feelings about this. I think the risk versus the reward, everything's a balance, right? Security is all about balancing risk and reward. Uh, so for, for the FBI, they obviously made the decision to just turn off all the back doors. And I, I get it, I get it. I think to them, uh, you know, they're probably like, ask for forgiveness, not for permission kind of thing, because you know for a fact that like, if the FBI were to be like, hey, we noticed there's a, a web shell running on your exchange server, you know, can, can we please patch it? Or can you please patch it? You know, for a fact, the business will be like, yeah, we'll just add that to our vulnerability list and we'll get to that you know in 100 days or whatever <laughs> not even and so like the the private companies and, and some of the public companies don't do a great job with following directions and that's why we have uh government agencies like CISA and everything trying to be better at it but you know we haven't reached that point yet it's absolutely still on the onus of the private companies to do security well we don't really have government leadership to like force on that on us but I, it, it makes me uneasy Easy. the fact that the FBI could just easily do that. Like, I didn't love that, but I get it. I understand the risk versus the reward. And again, as a security practitioner, you're always trying to find that risk balance with the benefit, right? Um, and so it, it, it was a little bit, you know, mixed feeling there. I get it, I get it. Funny story, I was supposed to be an FBI agent. I know for sure that's what I wanted to be growing up. And so April 22nd, 2010 was when I got the call to be an FBI agent. I was so excited, right? Oh, wow. So, yeah, I actually, my start date would have been June 6th, uh, 2010. So I would have gone to Quantico. So I ended up <laughs> writing the resignation letter and putting it on my boss's desk. And I was like, here you go. I'm going to resign. I'm going to be an FBI agent. Yay. It only took two years, right? Uh, but then I ended up having my background check redone. I didn't get past adjudication because I'm Asian. Yes, that's what oh, I'm Unfortunate. No, that's okay. 
we uh, we actually have a couple chapter members. They're not on tonight, but that are special agents with the FBI. Yeah, I'm kind of glad that I'm not. Like, I think I would have been an asshole. Like, so think about how I was an asshole in security. I would have taken that exact mindset and just like compounded it with a badge, credentials, and a gun. Like, I would have been like, no, I'm here, assholes. Like, you know, I would have been such a bad. You would have been, it would have been interesting when you did the uh, firearm simulation hot situation because <laughs> I did that. And that I'd be like, pew, pew, ask, ask forgiveness, not permission. Yeah. No mercy, right? Cool. Mm. Any other uh, any other questions for Naomi from everybody? Yeah, oh, thank you so much, James. I, I appreciate that. I hope you learned a little bit today about mm -hmm. breaking into leadership. Uh, my DMs are open. Uh, you know, I'm happy to talk and chat back and forth there. I, I love these opportunities, so thank you. I hope I get CPEs for this. James. Sure. Okay. Good. Talk to Christopher. He's our uh, he handles all our CPEs. <laughs> we, can get, we can throw you a couple of years. It's just filing the CPEs is a pain in the butt. Just make sure um, we get your uh, IC squared and member number. That's true. I think well, I have three, three. Starts with a three. Three. Yeah, yeah. so do mine. Nice. nice. Yeah, we actually have one member. I think he's got five numbers in his member. In his membership. Wow. That's yeah. old school. Four or five minute number. Mine's six. I've got six in mine, but I don't know what my number is. Let me see. It's on the yeah, wall. You gotta go look at that. <laughs> <laughs> mine hangs on the wall, so everything's gonna... on there somewhere. Where is it? Oh, no, mine's a three, three eight eight four five nine. So I'm a six. So you're six as well, like me. Okay. Both the presentation. Yeah, you get the presentation and the time it took to prepare. So yes. the time it took to prepare, that's what, 20 years because of the rant? You know, that's a lot of Ooh, that's awesome. <laughs> yes, I'm set for life. I don't ever have to be <laughs> again. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, happy to do this. This this is a labor of love for me. I love ranting. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. I, I know now you realize that I'm not this nice person. Like, <laughs> very, I'm very different uh, when I write because a writing is for me a cathartic way of getting out feelings. Yeah. And so uh, my real persona is what you just saw today. Love it. Now you're on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. but you're not on Twitter. I am on Twitter. Yes. Are you on Twitter? Oh, I couldn't find you this morning. Oh, so my real personality comes out on Twitter. You ah. should, yes. Uh, I'm a little more DL there. Uh, I need more cyber is my Twitter handle. And I rant about all the things, but I still try to keep it like infosec related, but you'll see me ranting about capitalism and, and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, you can, uh, if, you, if you want more of this torture, uh, follow me on Twitter. What um, would you say your handle was? I need more cyber. It's a play on from- more, That's it, yeah. Yeah, it's there like I need more cowbell. I don't know. Naomi, not Naomi. <laughs> Yes. Um, here, I will drop her handle. Yeah, definitely want to follow Naomi on, on Twitter. She's always got good stuff. Um, That's when I, when I make fun of all the things. Like, all the things that I wish I could say on LinkedIn goes on Twitter. Goes on Twitter. That is my real feelings on things, yes. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't really spend too much time there. Maybe check it once a day. But, yeah. um, I like LinkedIn. Follow her on LinkedIn. Yeah. yeah. See her on Twitter. Um, cool. Well, you're welcome to stick around for the next part, Naomi, and, okay. and add to this. Um, so the speaker that I had lined up, Gabriel, unfortunately, his partner came into town with this business um, and he ended up having to go off and do that. And so he let me know like 10 minutes after we started that. Don't. Oh, sorry, guy. I'll make it up to you. So we've just I've just banned him for life now. Um, <laughs> anyway, what. So. I am always, um, you know, always thinking, oh my gosh, what would happen if we didn't have a speaker? So I've always got a, a collection of ideas and thoughts. And as I was chatting with the member, the officers, one of the uh, last year when COVID hit, uh, we did our February event, which was a breakfast brief. That was a DCPI, our last in-person event we've had. We were supposed to do the March event. And then, of course, COVID hit and everything got shut down and we shut down. And then we finally did an event at the end of April. And we kind of had to regroup, figure out how we were going to do it, platform and everything else. Well, ironically, the meeting date for that was April 27th last year. So that's a year ago tomorrow. Um, well, if anybody was on that call and remembered what we talked about, we as the officers discussed what our reactions was were to COVID, how our organization reacted and everything else. So one of the things I'm going to do for the next little bit is we're going to talk to the officers that are on the call and kind of see, you know, how you've, you know, where are you now? Um, you know, a year ago when COVID struck, 
you know, we were all working from home. So now what's it like a year later, we're still in the pandemic, but things are kind of opening. Well, things are opening up here in Florida. Um, but you know, where, where is everybody with that? So um, what I'm going to do is just kind of go around. So hopefully the officers are all, all ready to go, but basically just kind of hear from them on, you know, what, what it's like in their work environment now, what is it that they're doing? And then what I'd like to do is if there's any member that we've got that's on the call now that wants to, um, has there, is, if any of them have written any articles and want to talk about those, um, we'd be kind of curious to see kind of feeding in from what Naomi was talking with us about, you know, that, you know, writing and whether it's 20 years of rants, we'll see. So we got a little time. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, Walter, Oh, Walter, my vice, our vice president, not my vice president, our vice president. Um, how is, uh, how are things for you a year later? Anything? Is it the same? Is it better? Is it worse? Is it um, better? I, <laughs> we've been really busy. Um, I, I think really because they recognized early on that, you know, we already had remote workers. That wasn't a big deal. Uh, it was just really just ramping up for the scale. Um, beyond that, though, it, it it started getting really busy because I, I think that's early on they realized, hey, we need to definitely put a lot more focus around this. Um, you know, so it's been nonstop. Um, go, go, go uh, the entire time. Which has been taxing uh, because, at least on a personal level, um, the days just are blurring. Um, and yeah, you, I mean, like a, like a lot of people, you end up finding yourselves, you know, working, you know, 12, 14 hour days um, for weeks and weeks on end. So, but, but I, I it's, at least the back half, um, you know, once we got around the holidays and going into into the new year, um, I, I started seeing at least uh, with my group a lot more focus around uh, mental health, burnout concerns, uh, really trying to talk to people and take breaks and just have coffee chats, you know, virtually and, and, and things like that. Just Just things to kind of keep that personal uh, interaction that we used to get in the office, uh, and kind of, you know, took for granted, um, so that it feels a little bit more, a uh, little bit more normal again. Uh, so now are you permanently working from home or uh, I am right now? Yes. Um, <laughs> any signs um, you get to go back to an office? What's that? Any signs or any indication that you'll get to go back to an office? Though? Um, it, it's still kind of up in the air right now as to when, you know, you know, we're kind of trying to read the tea leaves, um, because our group is very, very methodical, right. um, uh, and very paced at how they approach, uh, things. So, you know, we've definitely seen a lot of good things, um, you know, and, you know, core, core people are all at work, working, um, People who can remote can uh, work remotely. They have working remotely, um, and they're just going to slowly, you know, gradually. So we're, I mean, we're kind of thinking, you know, probably, you know, late summer, early fall is when we might start uh, start. Yeah, starting to go back in, and of course, it's going to be the typical. Okay, you know. Is everybody there at the same time? We're going to kind of alternate things, you know, and, and, and I don't know about other folks. I know on LinkedIn and all, I always see the, you know, click the symbol for what you want, you know, um, from permanent work remote to in the office all the time. And the majority of the folks tend to say somewhere in the middle. Okay. Interesting. So. Um, any lessons learned from your enterprise organization that, you know, that kind of came out of everything that's happened in the last year? Uh, I, like I said, I, yeah, I mean, like I said, I, we were already, you know, had remote capabilities, you know, so nothing there. I mean, we were prepared for that. I, I think the, the big learning coming out of this, um, 
it, it really comes down to if you are going to work remote, because uh, I know this impacted me personally, is the blur, uh, the blur between personal and business and just basically it evaporated. Um, it's really kind of my personal take would be try to set up those boundaries, you know, try to set up, you know, the I'm going to start at this time, end at this time, unless there's an emergency. And other than that, really try to kind of keep that same, you know, business hour mentality uh, that you need to just to maintain some separation. Good to know. Yeah. I mean, and we were talk, touching upon that with Naomi as well as about that, that mental health. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Debbie, oops, I think you're still on, you're there. Um, you're a consultant and you work, you have your own company. So what's it been like for you the last year where it's been kind of tricky to go out and work? It's, it's, it has been interesting because I have to a lot of times go on site to my clients. And, and um, so I've had to get COVID tests so that I could fly and nobody ever asked me for them. So I'm not doing that anymore. Um, Jeez. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, it's been busy um, because the threat actors have been so busy. And um, be, my consulting side, as far as risk analysis and, and compliance, tanked. But my IR side just escalated, and so um, it's been good. So, any any interesting lessons learned for you then? From yes, don't use remote desktop <laughs> on the internet. Yeah, yes, that's what happened. Was that you know everybody had to go home really quickly. And, and most homes are not set up for any kind of security whatsoever. And now you've got these doctors that are, you know, they're trying to get their schedule because they're, you know, some of these states were initially we were on a day to day basis and, and some of them were on, well, I can see emergencies and what constitutes an emergency. So they were just going in, but they have no controls at home to to block anything. And of course, we saw the Zoom um pirates coming in and and that kind of thing so um i think that you know a lot of people learn that they need to have security in their homes yeah i think that was a lot of that was a big surprise for a lot of folks and with the organizations as well with people working remote granted if they had vpns but if they didn't yeah especially on some of the small medium businesses yeah actually a lot of them didn't know um because remember, a lot of this happened right around March and March 15th, when corporate um, taxes are due. And then, of course, April 15th was normally when taxes were due. And we saw a big amount of CPAs, small CPA companies that got hit with ransomware. Wow. Yeah, you've been dealing with a lot of that, right? Yes. yes. So any, any interesting lessons from the ransomware that you've been seeing besides don't click on the phishing links? Uh, actually, since October, so early on, um, it was just hit, get the, get out and, and pay me money. Now what we're seeing is oh, since okay. October, we're seeing data exfiltrated. Right, right. Yep. So we've been, it, it, pretty much everybody's had their data exp, exfiltrated, of my cases, except for one, since October. Wow. Okay. So is that forcing a lot of folks and a lot of these organizations to pay up? Uh, no, they're having to report. Because it's a HIPAA? Yep. yep. Wow. And, and states. So all 50 states have some sort of privacy law, and you have to report to the state where the, where the per primary residence is at the time of your incident. So a lot of people went home or to different states um, during COVID, and now they're living in different places than where the doctor is. And so, for example, I have one that she is in Massachusetts, but because of the way everybody went home, we wound up reporting to New York, Massachusetts, of course, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and Virginia, as well as as well as Office of Civil Rights. Have you um, did you experience any um, of those practices where they targeted the patients and went after the patients for money or the clients for the money? Yeah, we've had a couple of those. <gasps> I've heard about that. I've heard that's kind of the next thing. If the practice won't pay, they go after the the clients yeah. or the patients and go, "Hey, we got this data on you. We're going to release it, or you pay." And there's 
and there's actually a business associate, it, it, they're a patient contact company that they were hacked. And the doctors are th saying, thinking that, well, it, it wasn't me that was hacked, so I'm clear. But what's happening is the, the, uh, they're going after the patient's um, bank accounts. And yeah. so mm -hmm. that's going to, we're waiting to see how that's going to play. That just happened a couple of days ago. So we're waiting to see, but patients are going to the doctors and saying, hey, my Bank of America account was hacked because they yeah. came in from you. And yeah. so because they're able to make payments online. So um, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Well, good to hear. Good. Things are going well for you and you're keeping busy. So Christopher, let's turn on over you, sir. What's it like been you for the last year? And are you back in the office and all that good stuff? Yeah, so yeah. I haven't been back in my office for almost exactly a year. Uh, you know, wow. when we when we were kicked out um, at the beginning of COVID, um, I made I made one trip back in the office. You know, to get an extra monitor and a docking station and stuff like that. Um, so I have not set foot in the office. Um, you know, towards middle of last summer, um, naturally they were starting to let those um, critical employees. Uh, back into our office. Um, the, the company that I work for, we're, we're largely a services organization, right, that services other Mitsubishi companies. Um, so the other Mitsubishi companies who are largely manufacturers, right, so they, um, they want to get back to work as quickly as possible, you know, because they're building multi-million dollar gas turbines and, and stuff like that. So they've got contracts and things to, to keep up on. Um, we had, we've just been given notice that, uh, we're going to be forced to return to the office here in the next couple of weeks. Oh, wow. Um, so, you know, vaccine or no vaccine, uh, you'll be, you'll be forced to come back to the office. Uh, you'll be requested to come back to the office and work in the office going forward. Wow. Um, naturally there's a lot of mixed emotions around that. Um, cause largely what our organization's proven in the last year is that most of us can do our jobs from home and be just as effective as we ever were, uh, if not more effective in some cases. Recognizing that, you know, there's differences in personalities. Some people thrive on the office environment, you know, and the collaborative experience. Uh, some of us thrive in, you know, solitary work environments uh, where we need, you know, quiet, focused times of flow and, and things like that. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's lots of questions uh, concerning what about, you know, our kids that are still virtual school and it's like we just spent this last year adapting to a new way of living and now you want to instantly pull a plug on that and reverse it all. So everyone, so there's a lot of people that, you know, are kind of upset saying this is, sure. this is, is going to be just as difficult as it was a year ago trying to adjust right. to post COVID yeah. now to readjust back to pre COVID. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting to see how society handles it overall. Um, so we had a, a nice comment here from Eric. As a manufacturer, we didn't stop working at the office, and we were already socially distanced. We were also considered an essential business. The changes to our work was very minimal, as we were already an online business. If you want, to, yeah, you want to explain further, Eric? Go ahead and unmute. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. A little muffled, oh. but there you go. Amazing. Um, so basically, as a manufacturer, we had, uh, we're only about 25 employees. We were already in offices uh, spread out around the building, and we were already spread out in the manufacturing plant. So being that all of our sales is done through my website, we were able to stay socially distanced. Uh, we were able to work in the office most of the time, uh, even though most of my work could be done remotely. My requirement was that I was in the office almost 100% of the time. Um, oh, wow. So the fact that we are a manufacturer of uh, an essential bit, uh, an essential Thing called uh, water, um, we were able to work from home, uh, work from the office, be able to work um, 
uh, non-remotely, as it were, and still get to work on safely. Oh. Cool. All right. I don't. I don't know if Eric dropped off or you, you finished there, but um. No, I finished. Oh, you finished. Okay, great. <laughs> Gotta love technology. Sometimes it's like ah. Um. Great. So uh, let's let's move on with uh, let's see Walter Rushford. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't think I know. Did I see Amy was on? I don't have my. I'm, phone. I'm here. I don't yep. Hey, Amy. Hi there. So from the Accenture standpoint, we're actually still grounded. So we're not oh, traveling. Wow. We're not going to the office. Um, there are just a very small, limited amount of client requirements where from a part of delivery, it needs to be in the office. But other than that, um, we've had such success with virtual collaboration and being able to still go through the sales cycle and, and close big deals remotely that, that the amount of money that a center saves on the travel expenses really was something that they want to continue. So at this point, we're still grounded. We're not in the office, um, but we're very busy with all things cloud security and digital. So a lot of clients are now making a pretty much cloud uh, a race to get there. And from a security standpoint, our clients are really kind of saying that supply chain was the most exposed security area for their client, for our clients. So nobody really paid attention to that until COVID. But now that we've got all these manufacturing companies out there, they've got the factories and the plants, and they're now starting to incorporate a lot of IoT, and there's a lot of security risk with those devices. So they're being deployed very quickly in order to help, you know, automate and, and continue processing the business. But it's something to where it, it's really exposed from a from a security standpoint. Wow, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know we've seen a lot of exposed cloud containers and cloud issues and IoT devices over the last year through the different breaches. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, I think Rob's on. Mr. Riva, are you on? You want to add to it? I think he was on. I saw him comment. Or maybe he can't. Um, maybe he can't. Okay. Um, and I know Paul's not on. I don't. I haven't seen Tom on unless I'm missing them in the list. But uh, there, there's Rob. Oh, there's Rob. Yeah, I'm just uh, changing around some uh, settings here. <laughs> can you hear me now? We can hear you. We can see you. Right. You might be able to see me. All right. Yeah. yeah. I got a couple different mics, but uh, yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Reba. Uh, James, I don't know if you mentioned it earlier, but uh, about the communications role. I did. I sure okay, did. Great. Yeah, I was with uh, my at T-Ball, so uh, a little late, but I was able to catch most of Naomi's presentation. Cool. Yeah, so I, I'm here in Central Florida. Um, the organization I'm with, they, they promote a full workforce prior to COVID. So for them, it, there really wasn't a beat that was missed. And uh, I'm, I'm in cloud security. So uh, now for me, I transitioned to remote uh, from a full-time position and uh, I love it, right? Like uh, as the other board member said, um, everyone has a different way of adapting to a uh, remote or in the office and uh, either way it works for me, but I love being at home, uh, having that flexibility to uh, relax. I did sell my car. So my wife and I are down to one oh, wow. vehicle. <laughs> but uh, most of our stuff over here in Melbourne is, is pretty local. So if I need to, I'll just Uber somewhere. But um, so yeah, like the car. Yeah, I got you. Take some money there, and um, you know, as Walt mentioned, with the burnout, we uh, one of the things we picked up during the pandemic was uh, just a travel trailer. So we've been doing a lot of camping around Central Florida, and I think that's been helping me sort of just tune out of the uh, you know, 10, 11 hour days that I see myself in. Wow. It's been nice. Cool. Well, one of the, uh, well then you being in cloud, you're gonna get a kick out of uh, our speaker next month. Um, hey, there's a little T-ball champion. Um, the uh, next month, uh, our, so we're gonna do the May uh, book club with manipulation, which we talked about. Still need people to come and be on the panel. Uh, but the speaker that we have lined up, her name is Gwen Betwee, and Gwen has been teaching cloud security 
oh geez, for several years. Let's just put it several years. I mean, however long Cloud's been going around in the certification for CCSP, and she's written a book on CCSP. And uh, so she's um, she's going to come talk to us next month regarding cloud security. And then, of course, we're going to have the, the uh, manipulation book club chat as well. Um, <laughs> just for a little transparency and some fun. Uh, but Gwen was my boot camp instructor that I had how many years ago? 13 plus 14 years ago um, when I took my CISSP. And um, so she was the instructor. We've kept in touch and been friends over the years. So uh, we were chatting a couple weeks ago and she was telling me about the book. So I was like, hey, why don't you come check the chapter? So she's going to come and talk to us about cloud security. So uh, that should uh, drum up some interesting conversations as well. Um, let's see, what else in the comments? Robert said, end of March, the base went on full telework, essential person only allowed in, three three months of hell. Yeah, I bet. I can certainly imagine getting the workforce up to speed with remote access. Typically had to go in once a week to keep things running. Six months, it looked like a scene from the post-disaster movie. Yikes. Few cars, long grass, no people. Oh, wow. So they were filming Walking Dead, I guess, over by you then. Uh, officially, we're still on maximized telework, but many people can come in at least once a week. I know at No Before, at our offices, they're slowly allowing people back in. You got to apply. You got to, you know, um, go through a temperature check every day when you walk in. So, um, I mean, I work from home anyway, but going down to the the office, it's. Um, uh, you know, when I've gone in, I have to basically fill out a ticket, let them know, hey, I'm coming in and, um, you know, and, and go from there. So John said at DOD, it was a race against time to modify policy contracts to allow work from home before we were locked out of the building. Yeah. And now that everybody's been working from home, hopefully we'll start getting some folks coming back. So cool. Um, that's that's an interesting, cool. sorry, James, that was an interesting thought because um, you know, right now the restaurant industry and the um, hospitality industry is really suffering from a work shortage, short yeah. workers and stuff, because when COVID came and they all couldn't work, they all went and found other jobs. Mm -hmm. and now restaurants are trying to ramp back up to almost full capacity, but they don't have the workers. Yeah. And I'm wondering if, if that is a similar trend that we've seen in any of our other industries or organizations. Right. Yeah, no, good point. I know from personally, uh, a couple of friends of mine that work in the industry, a lot of the time they haven't been able to fill positions is because the servers they have are still staying at home on unemployment benefits because they get more than that than, you know, the guaranteed tips that they could be getting. So I, I think it's a combination of both. People went and looked for the work because they had to work or they're having, they're enjoying it being on unemployment. But I am curious, yeah, if anybody else is seeing anything, uh, anything similar if there's any other industry that's having the same problem outside of you know sir restaurant and hospitality well i can tell you from a sensor standpoint we're hiring in that cloud digital and security space and we can't hire them fast enough so wow. mm -hmm. interesting friend in healthcare city used to have a stack of apps to pick from but now we can't find people oh wow Mm -hmm. Oh, applications. Okay. Yeah. Healthcare can't get people to work. Yep. Yeah. Well, I think there's a fear there as well as, you know, uh, the same issues. Yeah. K to 12 teachers are retiring early. Yep. My, uh, my wife is pretty well retired from teaching. Uh, yeah. I think a lot of it is just don't want to have that exposure, the frustration. Well, there K through 12 teachers are already retiring prior to COVID. That's due to some other issues, but. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting how we are dealing with it, you know, with the industry and, and everything else. So, Ooh. all righty. Well, what do we got? We got 10 after eight. I'm, uh, unless there's anything else anybody wants to chat about, I think we will call it a evening. Um, certainly want to thank Naomi. She had to drop off. Dinner was calling. So she had to get, uh, uh, she had to get going, but she certainly provided a interesting perspective uh, of thoughts of getting into cybersecurity, cyber cybersecurity leadership. And um, so, yeah, so we will make sure that as long as we got everybody's name and Christopher is able to match it up with your CPs, uh, your 
IHC squared cert number, then we will have that submitted for you. It does take a couple of weeks and then it takes them a couple of weeks. So usually before the next meeting, we have the CPEs are, are should be added. Um, if not, then let us know. It's harder to teach some to teach some days as well. Can't wait for the semester to be over in two weeks. Yeah, my semester ends this week. Um, but then I start up again in two weeks. So and I know that Christopher's teaching, I'm teaching, and I know we've got a bunch of the members that are teaching as well. Yeah, I want to pick some of your brains about how you submit CPEs for teaching courses. But we'll do that offline. Okay. I Thanks. don't I don't submit CPEs for my teaching. I haven't either, so no. yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah, Stephen, I, I'm working through the exact same thing right now. And the best that I can figure is that you could claim the prep time that you spend, yep. yeah, but not the in-class time. That's what I figured. So, But I'm I'm not clear on. And, and I haven't, and I'm pretty bad about I haven't submitted anything to see. Semester. <laughs> yeah, I haven't submitted anything yet to see how it would be received. Okay, cool. Well, my only <laughs> thing was probably yeah. get a letter from my department head saying what classes I teach. But, yeah. I mean, if you do presentations, I know those count. If you do a workshop, like a one-time workshop or a particular Yeah, I do presentations class, every week. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, but if it's like a for, like a boot camp type thing that you create, you can get CPEs. But for actually where you're teaching like a full semester, I don't know. Um, yeah. I'll have to check next time I have. And, and, it's, and it's kind of vague how they word it. So. Yeah. yeah. The best I can compare to is a conference presentation where yeah. you get – credit for preparing, but not for actually delivering. That's talks. what I thought. Right. Yeah. So. It's easy to get credit for doing the uh, safe and secure. Yeah. If you can get it really on. is. Yes, it is. Which is a good program. It's a good program. Yeah. So it's cool. Hey, I plug it once. It's funny. Poor Naomi dropped off. I forgot to show her I had this. Yeah. There we go. It's the, it's our award that we got, you know, so but I'll have to send her a picture. <laughs> So, cool. All right. Well, everybody, like I said, two CPEs for tonight. We are back next month on May 20. I can't get my mouse over the calendar fast enough. May 24th. I was going to say 26th. I knew it wasn't right. May 24th, Monday night. Um, we'll do the book club, and then we have Gwen presenting. Looking forward to that. And we are look, working towards getting ourselves some uh, in-person events again. So look for those. In the coming months, we have to work logistics and all that good stuff. So, but um, again, thank you everybody for your time this evening. Uh, it was great to see you. Great to hear from you. I always enjoy these chats. Um, it'll be interesting to see if we get back in real life how we work it, whether we can do it virtually. So, um, um, but yeah, um, the anyone know any good resources for ISSEP preparation besides ISC squared? I'm not sure. Um, I haven't done the prep for the uh, EP part of the uh, CISSP. Um, but if anybody knows any, drop it in the chat. Otherwise, um, thank you, everybody. Have yourself a wonderful evening, wonderful week, and we will see you next month. Thanks. 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 Discord certification station has a few channels. Bye, to James. Out. See you, Avi. Thanks for joining, buddy. Yeah, I'm driving, so sorry I couldn't have the video stuff going. That's okay. We don't need to see you driving. Uh, I, I'm surprised you ever really want to see me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't wait for in-person meetings, man. Me too. Yeah, I'm I'm ready to get get going back again because I don't know too many other chapters that are doing it yet. So I want to kind of ready for it. Maybe maybe take a survey on it and see. Um, see if we could do that and open it up with with telecom so that some people can come in over the yeah. eight by eight while yeah. others can come in person depending on people's you know situations yeah that's what we want to do we want to try to do a hybrid where people can do it thompson you saw me it was at fox 35 talking about the new apple ios yep yeah okay they i interviewed with them on friday um and i didn't know if the video dropped they never sent me anything so now i gotta go look for it <laughs> But yeah, we want to do a hybrid meeting, and so we got to work logistics of video and internet and all that stuff. So you're still Ooh. recording, James. Yep. Thanks. Mm, let's stop the recording. Uh, let me make him feel like that we're here. Uh, stop recording.